the Million Dollar Mortgage Experience Podcast. All right, welcome to the show. We are here with G.A. Bartek. He's an international speaker. He is a top sales coach, and he's ready to take your sales team to the next level. So welcome Absolutely. to the show. Hey, pleasure, pleasure to be here, John. Yeah. And glad to see everybody out there. Looking forward to talking to you. Awesome. Well, tell us about your background. Like, how did you get to be top sales coach? Wow, that's that's a that's a interesting story. So right now at Concilio, I spend all my time working with people to be better communicators. Okay. Whether it's sales, customer service, leadership, what's that conversation with a customer to really create a unique and different, but more importantly, really a positive buying experience? Yeah. You know, rewind almost 30 years now. I started my sales career at Nordstrom mm -hmm. as a lady shoe salesperson, <laughs> and I got to admit, I wasn't very good at selling. Okay. And I was actually put on a PIP. You know what a PIP is? Yeah, the pr uh, Progress Improvement Plan or whatever, yes. performance. And, and yeah. they put you on that because you're crushing it? Or is that usually step two of one, two barbecue? Yeah, yeah it's, the, it's the one where you, you, yes. can, you so, get can most of the time, right? Yes. So I was that close, but I really want to get into management. Okay. So a management job opened up. I worked my tail off for like three weeks, got myself off of my PIP, mm -hmm. which got me, you know. So it kind of lit a fire under you, right? A little bit, a wow. little bit. Got me into management. I spent the next 11 years, though, really understanding what does a great customer experience look like okay. the Nordstrom way. Right. Again, Nordstrom, is it a sales company or is it a customer service organization? Dude, it's a sales organization, you know, $13 billion. Right. But how they do it through the customer experience. So that kind of really cut my teeth on how important the customer experience is. Mm -hmm. Then I left Nordstrom to make my million selling real estate. Okay. So got my license. Not a bad move. Got a desk over with Joe Jelly at Jelly Real Estate in downtown Del Mar. Mm -hmm. And was figuring people will buy from me. I do have the gift of Gab. I mean, G.A. Bartik, those are my initials. Oh, Gab, yeah. Yes, and my obvious good looks. So <laughs> I was there eight months, and it's end of the day, and my my broker calls me into his office and says, hey, G.A., can I talk to you real quick? I'm like, yeah, what's going on? He goes, G.A., you know what? I love your enthusiasm. I love your work ethic. But I've looked at the sales results. You only sold one house in the last eight months. I'm sorry, it's just not working out. Mm. And they had me a cardboard box. Yeah. It's like, okay, no worries. I got a job selling eyewear. 11 months, got my cardboard box. Hmm. I sold corporate photography. It was there 14 months. Okay. My wife is pretty excited. I kept a job for over a year. <laughs> uh, and then got called into the manager's office. And what was right behind him? Cardboard box. Another cardboard yeah. box. So I was trying to figure out why am I having such a difficult time with my gift to gab, my personality, and selling. Mm -hmm. Then I realized I, I was winging it with no process. Yep. So I started reading every book, you know, Zig Ziglar, Brian Tracy, all the books out there, get them early. Yep. And they all had kind of tips and tricks. And I did, and now I'm a mortgage banker. Okay. Yeah, I'm 28 years old. I'm working for Rancho Coastal Funding in Encinitas. And I started looking at what are top performing salespeople doing in the mortgage industry, in the real estate industry. Mm -hmm. Then I sat down and did a mortgage for a, a gentleman, just bought a house for $1.4 million, wanted a million dollar mortgage. And I started using some of the techniques that I've been looking at and, and observing these top performers, nothing in any of the books I've been reading, and started using it and really tried to create a different experience. Mm -hmm. And I got the deal when I asked him, why did you go with me versus the banker he was already talking to? Mm -hmm. He goes, GA, it was so obvious. You just took a genuine interest in me. Hmm. And the experience I had with you was so different than I had with my current banker. Interesting. So I said, oh, there's something to this. So I started interviewing more and more people and brought my brother into the game. And over about four and a half years, did about 6,000 interviews, 33,000 pages of notes, and wow. ended up writing the best-selling book, Silver Bullet Selling. And really book, kicked yeah. off really kicked off my 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 consulting career mm -hmm. which wasn't wasn't the wasn't the really the idea but what i saw out there the need was people needed a tractor rundown right so it's called silver bullet selling six critical steps to opening up more relationships and mm -hmm. closing more sales cuz especially in the mortgage business i think the biggest mistake brokers make is they make it a logical transaction mm -hmm. when it's truly an emotional transaction right so that's really what I work on is how do you communicate? What do you say? How do you say it? Mm -hmm. Because that's, again, if you're not the low price leader, it's that communication, that conversation that makes the biggest impact. Right. So that's what kind of kicked off my consulting career and been doing it for almost 20 years now. Now I got to admit, that I've been married 30 years this year. Oh, well, congrats. Thank you much. The first five years of my marriage sucked. Why? Because <laughs> I kept collecting cardboard boxes. Yeah, that's tough. I've done a pretty good job the last 25 years, but... <laughs> 
I still, still the statute of limitations has not run out <laughs> on, Miss, on, <laughs> Miss, on Mrs. Bartik letting me know she carried me the first five years. But that's funny. So that's how I got to where I am today is yeah. really just because I was out there flailing, winging it, and realized, and Concilio, the company but name. you wanted to be a salesperson. Like oh. deep down, you wanted to be the best. And, and, but you just couldn't, you couldn't hack it. At the well, I, I, would, I mean, I've been a salesperson since I was a little kid. I mean, like I, what, what did you sell when you were young? So I sold when I was in Little League. Yeah. We had Little League stickers. Okay. I went around house to house to house to house. I'd get all my friends. I'd sell theirs for a buck. Give them a Little League sticker. Nice. Then my first kind of real job as an entrepreneur mm -hmm. was, John, I noticed that the address on your curb needs to be repainted. Okay. I'd be happy to repaint on one side for $5 or both sides for 7 Which would you like? <laughs> That's great. And that was my pitch. And my parents would drop me off in a neighborhood. Yeah. I'd spend three hours. And I'd do 15, 20 houses at yep. five or seven bucks a pop. My nephew does that. And so that's kind of, so yes, I figured I was always great in sales until I got to Nordstrom and started having issues until I then, you know, left and started in the, in the, put my big point pants Maybe on. Maybe it was because you were an entrepreneur and it was not necessarily sales. Possibly it? so, you yeah. know, but, but again, it, it didn't click until I saw, oh, there's a process these people are all mm -hmm. using. Mm -hmm. You know, how do they pre-call plan? How do they set themselves up for success right. before I ever pick up the phone, before they ever talk to a prospect? Right. How do they build rapport? When you're talking to a prospect, especially when you're a mortgage broker, you're talking about their number one biggest asset in their life, right. their home. And a lot of times you start asking, okay, how much money you have? What's your down payment going to be? What's your LTV going to be? You skip all the, the stuff that makes people feel good. Yeah, and you go right into that logical stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's all about qualifying, which I get. Yeah. But who are those questions for? Right. They're for the for the broker, yeah. not for the customer. So how do you so how do you go through deep discovery and take a mm -hmm. genuine interest in another person? How do you then really present a tailored solution? Because again, think about it. Every prospect out there you talk to, they all think, oh, John, you must you might have done two thousand other loans, but my situation, oh, <laughs> we're totally different and unique. Yeah. So a big part of this process lets the customer feel that, oh wow. John, you get me. Yeah. So then how do you present that really benefit-rich tailored solution? Are they always going to say yes? No. You're going right. to get some pushback. Right. 92% of the time, most customers have at least one objection. Mm -hmm. Then how do you answer that objection? And most of the time, people are very confrontational. Mm -hmm. Objection, response, objection, response. Your rate's too high. Your costs are too much. Your fees are too high. Right. Then we try to, try to convince them they're not. And that's yeah. just a tough way to go about doing it. Right, right. So then how do you ask for the order? So, you know, pre-call planning, build report, discovery, tailored solution, address concerns, close a sale. Those six steps, I kept seeing the top performers in real estate and in mortgage. They were just doing it. Doing that over and over and over again. And I'm like, ah, oh, there's something to that. And that's, mm -hmm. and I'm like, hey, there's the track. My brother's an Emmy Award winning writer. So I brought him in and ended up with the book. Nice. So all that's in there, right? All, the, all, all those of that. steps. Absolutely. I remember, man, back in the old days when I would do cold calling, I remember this this guy that would sit next to me. He'd, he'd always do this thing called check for acceptance. And he'd be so, it, but it was so easy for him. It was like, all he'd have to do is say, so your rate's going to be this, okay? And he'd yeah. just do the okay. We call, like, I call it a tie down. Right, Absolutely. it's a tie down. So I would be like, man, and he'd always get the deal. And I'm, and he would, he would do that and a couple other steps that you probably have in there too. Yep. Um, and I just was like, man, this guy's it's kind of it was because it was awkward. Like I, it wasn't natural for me to do that. Like okay, you know, at the end of everything. But now I think when I send emails, if I'm ever trying to get a response, I always end with either okay or just a question mark. Yeah. Or how does that sound? Right. That's the, the how do, how does that sound is also another it's another, another tie down. Yeah. So and the, and the whole thing is I really think there's two parts being really really good at sales. Mm -hmm. One part process. One part personality. Mm -hmm. So the one thing I've been been able to do for the last twenty years is just observe tons of top performers and poor performers yeah and what's the delta between the two and it almost always comes down to the top performers sometimes they're unconsciously competent they don't even know they're doing it mm -hmm. but just because i'm looking for that i can break down what's that process they're using how are they using it and so it's one part process one part personality have so, you ever been with the with the salesperson you're just like I just don't think you're going to ever cut it out as a salesperson. All I'm going to have to let you time. down like uh Yeah, all the time. A lot of our you clients. You should go into yeah. customer service or you should go into some other side of the business like Yeah. Or and, or even like I'm just wondering cuz you went through like you said like 5 yeah. years of this. Yes. And then you came out on the other end successful. So like is it is it is there for sure people that just can't become salespeople or is it just too hard for them or So it comes down to two things. One 
when I see salespeople who, who aren't going to make it, yep. they either A, can't tell a great story. So they have not practiced enough their communication skills mm -hmm. or B, they're unwilling to tell it to enough people. Yeah. The first part, telling a great story, I can help most people get there. Okay. Again, as a mortgage broker, your job is being a professional communicator. Mm -hmm. But most people underestimate the time, the energy, the effort by a thousand fold. How much effort it takes to become a great communicator? Because mm -hmm. I don't know about you, even before we started this, John, I was kind of rehearsing in my mind how I was going to kick this off. Yeah. And in my mind, it was beautiful. <laughs> Every word was slowly articulated. Yeah. I spoke clearly and slowly. But I don't know about you, but sometimes what I'm hearing in my mind, what comes out of my mouth, are sometimes two totally different things. Same here, yeah. So how do you go from, we call it verbal knowledge. That's kind of mm -hmm. knowing what to say. Right. So you go to a training, and I'm sure all of you guys have been out there, and, and I'm sure you've done a ton of training too. Mm -hmm. And you walk away, ooh, that's really good. Or the facilitator says, or you hear, you hear another top performer say something, you go, ooh, I can say that too. Mm -hmm. And in your mind, it's great. But what you want to, what you think, and what comes out of your mouth are sometimes two totally different things. Right. So how do you move from verbal knowledge, that's knowing what to say, mm -hmm. to verbal skill? Right. And verbal skill is that actually being able to say it out loud. Yeah. To then ultimately verbal mastery, and verbal mastery is where you can say the right thing at the right time in those critical moments under pressure. Mm -hmm. You have a high value prospect and or a client on the line. Mm -hmm. It's what you say and how you say it that could be the feather that tips the scale your way. Oh yeah, because we have we're like into it. Intuitive beings, right? We yeah. Have, just the tiniest little nuance that comes across could just turn someone off. Well, like if you yeah. if you're not practicing, if you're not, if you're not confident when you say, like if you tell them the rate, how you say the rate, how you how you check, you know, anything, right? Yeah. Like we people just quickly can, especially like how we look through emails in the morning, right? And you, oh. just, you know intuitively, oh, that's a sales. That's that. I don't need that. Yep. I don't need that exactly. And, like, and because we have so much spam, so much junk that's come, coming to us every day, like barrage uh, of information that we have this like, I think it's a subconscious thing, right? Where we can intuitively know that I don't need to, to pay attention well, to this. Yeah, you're, you're spot on to that. And what's happening now, even more, that's why it's more difficult in the mortgage business because people are getting bombarded by so many different avenues mm -hmm. regarding their mortgage, whether it be a purchase or a refi. And what we're finding is that when you start to talk to them, their resistance is already really high yeah. based on their perception, their previous interactions with mortgage people. Mm -hmm. So what you say and how you say it, there's lots of little nuances. Right. And that's where we spend a lot of time, me and my team, coaching people on, again, telling a great story. But what are little nuances can do one of two things, either increase resistance mm -hmm. and reduce receptivity or can reduce resistance and increase receptivity. Nice. And again, it, you have to pay attention to that thing. I mean, think about it. You play golf at all? A little bit. All right. So you just go out to the first tee, get your Pro V1 out there, get your titles out there and swack it. Mm -hmm. Where are you? Where do you usually go to first? Yeah, the driving range. The driving range. Then where do you go to? Putt. Then you putt. Then if you're me, where do you go? To the to the bar. Absolutely. <laughs> but why do you, then you go out to the first tee. Why do you right. do all that stuff first? You're prepping. So the best version of yourself shows up. Sure. But I don't think most of the brokers out there watching this are not, they're not professional athletes, correct? It could be some ex professional athletes. Yes. Right? The key is they're professional communicators. Right. So I think about professional athletes. How much time do they practice off the field so they can be excellent on the field? Exactly. But salespeople, they don't practice their communication skills. They never get to that m verbal mastery. Mm -hmm. So again, it's telling is that a great like story. like sitting in front of a mirror and just saying, like, Beagle Bible Beauty and <laughs> Not, all those different yeah, things? Yeah. Love it. <laughs> no, it's but it's sitting there saying, okay, John. Tomorrow, I'm going to be presenting this rate in terms to a, to a client or a okay. prospect. Mm -hmm. Let me walk you through how I'm going to do that. Give me some coaching. Hey, I know they're going to be concerned about the rate. Our rate's a little bit higher than we talked about. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about how I'm going to overcome that. Mm -hmm. And again, even as managers, managers, there's two types of coaching going on. Deal-specific coaching and performance coaching. Mm -hmm. Most managers spend all their time deal-specific coaching. Mm -hmm. They walk into your office, hey John, I'm trying to put this deal together. Here's what's going on, here's the LTV, it's non-QM, all right, here's where the money's coming from, he owns a couple other properties, can we sit there and take depreciation off this, kind of use his income there, and you sit there and show him how to put the pieces together, right. how to make that deal happen, and the sales, the little, little loan officer runs out of there and goes, okay, got it. Thank you so much, boss. Mm -hmm. And that's deal-specific coaching. Right. And most managers think that's great coaching, which it is. You need that, yeah. But the second part is the skills coaching. Mm -hmm. All right, John, now we got how to put the deal together. 
How are you going to present that? What are you going to say? How are you going to say it? Let's practice that. Let me demonstrate it for you. Right. Then you can practice that. And that's the big key is that second piece in the coaching element from a manager. That's important. They're not sitting there saying, okay, what are you going to say? How are you going to say it? Yeah. Again, one part process, one part personality, telling a great story and, just and being then able telling to, like, to enough people. Think on your feet, right? To be able to know like as soon as they throw something at you that you kind of already prepared for that because yeah. you know – there's going to be like three or four things they're going to say. Well, if they say this, I'm going to say that. If they say this, I'm going to say that. You know, some people just can't naturally just jump to those answers. Well, so the, you got to practice. Key, yeah, you got to practice. And the thing is, it's not about scripts. I don't believe in scripts at all. No. Have you ever worked in a really scripted environment? Yep. I hate it. How come? I can't do it. Why is that? I just, it sounds so unnatural. Exactly. It's not, my, it's not I mean, I know, you know, I'm, a, I'm more of a creative person, so I I can't, I can't just follow what someone says. It's yeah. just... I, I and so again, own. but the, do the customers, do they have the script in front of them? No. So they don't follow their lines, do they? No. So when I work with organizations who already have a script, they want me to work with, I'm like, great. If you want me to stick to that script, we're not the company for you. Yeah. We call it freedom within a framework. I'm going to put a foundational process and framework in, mm -hmm. and then I'm going to have your team follow the process, stay within the guard, the guardrails, yeah. like, because it works. Right. But put your personality into it so you can really sit there and make it come to life. And when they know the process at a visceral level, when it's part of their communicational DNA, that's when you can bounce around from, okay, because again, thinking about it, there's not that many objections that customers have. No. And so if I already know what they are before they ever come up, we can start to practice those. Mm -hmm. So I can be at the ready. And really, again, it's what I say and how I say it. Yep. That's gonna be the feather that's gonna win the business. And most people are afraid to practice. Practice? Yeah. <laughs> so. I got something else to do. I got too many other things yeah, to do. Practice. Exactly. But it's like you said, if you want to be, you know, if you're a professional mortgage broker, you're mm -hmm. professional. Yeah. You got to practice to be professional. I mean, you're doing it as your profession, but don't you want to get better at being whatever it is that you do, right? And just, I mean, obviously they're listening to this podcast right now, so they are wanting to get better. Yes. So. Your advice is to just to practice. I mean, you need to practice. That's yeah. one of the main things. Is and, and the beautiful thing and is knowing what to practice yes. is huge. But you know, thinking about just objection process. Yep. How many objections do you think are out there in the world right now? A dozen, maybe less. Six. Most people, when I ask that question, they say, "What? Oh my God! It's an infinite amount. There's yeah. thousands of it. It's it, no. It's just there's just some there's different resistances. That's yeah. it. Yeah. So my my brother, who's a researcher by by trait, you know, over thousands of 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 watching and observing sales interactions, about 84% of the time comes down to about seven or eight typical objections. Mm -hmm. Cost, rate, previous Timing. bad experience, it's not, a, not the right time, gotta talk to my spouse, my business partner, somebody else. Yep. So there's a very finite few. Right. So figure out what those are for your business yeah. and get really, really good at responding to them. Yeah. But it's not objection responses, it's really clarifying. I mean, think about it. When somebody says, I'm a little concerned about your fees, mm -hmm. what could that mean? Yeah. It could mean that, you know what, I don't see the value in what you're charging. It could mean that I don't have, I don't have I, the money. I don't have the money. Right. Or it could mean that I'm looking at another another loan officer's quote and it's less than yours. Mm -hmm. That's three different things. All the person says, is, I'm a little concerned about your fees. Right. And I can do an amazing job. I can be spewing gold and answering the wrong objection. Would you think to, to answer that question, it would be good to, to pose a question back? Like, what concerns you about my fees? 100%. Because then you really know what they're going to say. I mean, then you really know what they're thinking. Exactly. So so our objection process, again, everything's process-based. Clarify and listen. Ask that clarifying question. What do, you, what do you really mean by that? Help me understand a little bit better. Right. Clarify and listen. Restate and cushion. Going to restate. Not going to repeat it, but restate it. You stayed a bit in it with a little softer. A little softer. Okay. I usually soften it up. Yeah. All right. So it's not as damaging. Yep. <laughs> Clarifying, listen, resetting cushion. Then I'm going to ask, and this is what people freak out all the time on me. I'm going to sit there and say, okay, John, in addition to feast, any other concerns you have? Mm. And when I'm facilitating and working with people, like, gee, you got to be kidding me. You want me to proactively bring up other More objections? Concerns? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, hell yes. I mean, think about Get them it. Get out now. Yeah. Well, do you have any loans right now you're working on that have not moved forward? Do you think it's because maybe we've not gotten to the real objection? Right. And so that clarifying question, hey, in addition to that, is there anything else is key. Let's get them all out there so I can actually deal with them. Yep. And again, that's something that most of the time, objection, response, objection, response. Yep. We try to convince you that our fees are where they are. And most of the time, the salesperson is going to lose that battle. Yeah. So you yeah. got to sit there and try a little different tact and really understand what specifically is it about the fees. Yeah. Then you can start building up the right response. And again, 
there's eight, 10, maybe a dozen different objections you're going to come up with over and over again. So figure out what they are. Do you have any evidence? Mm -hmm. So maybe I can sit there and have a success story about somebody who thought the same way. Or I can, I can sit there and show them some documentation mm -hmm. or a reference. So I have evidence. So a lot of people like that evidence-based uh, kind of uh, logic behind it. So, right, to overcome. Yep. So that's why I'm going to never take a look at objections. Okay, how are you going to respond? What's your clarifying question? How are you going to respond? And do we have any evidence to back it up that we can sit there and put in front of a borrower for the help them make a positive decision? That's great. All right. So um, right now, the, the market's crazy. Yeah. It's it, the rates aren't where they were, right? They're changing nope. every day. The they're, Fed just raised them. They say they're going to be five more potential raises. They even talked about a half a point increase, which is wow. which is a lot, right? So mortgage brokers, you know, were sitting on the easy, like low rate, low hanging fruit. They were they're getting you know people that just wanted to streamline refi. It was just an easy time, right? So now mm -hmm. we're shifting to this market where mortgage brokers, their pipelines are either cut in half or they're way down. The the loans that they have sitting on their desk are like, okay, well when the rates go back down, then call me. Right. Yep. And so, um, and some are like, you know, I need to get cash out, but then they're like, oh, the rate's too high. So it doesn't make sense. Uh, they're all kind of wondering what to do. So a bunch of them are trying to get into non-QM, which is a great idea. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and if you're not, if you're not in non-QM right now, learn it, get into it. Become an expert at it. hundred percent. Know everything about it. Right. So yeah. So beyond that, what, um, you know, what do you do when you're when your your whole pool dries up, right? You move to the next where the watering hole is, right? Yeah, we, it's it's all about increasing activity. Yeah. So I mentioned before, telling a great story and then telling it to enough people. Yep. And when I work with top performers and poor performers, the poor performers sometimes they are amazing salespeople, but they just don't tell their story to enough people. Right. So what can you do? You got to start thinking outside the box. You know, are you joining a group like Provisors, or are are you sitting there and, and how are you meeting in more? Real estate agents. What are you doing to make sure you are out in the community more than ever before? Right. And you may have to pick up the phone and maybe potentially do some cold calling too. Oh man, you said that. Yeah, yeah. C word. Yeah, which right? which I hate cold calling. <laughs> right. There's 133 things I'd rather do than make an outbound cold call. Right. Because why do I have, I have that list? Why do I have that list? What? When was I, I was making that list? When I should have been doing what? Uh, making outbound cold yeah, calls. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but I hate making them. But I mean, I'm sure you have. I made. Tons of money on outbound oh, we cold calls. We had to calls. do power hour like every, twice oh, a day. Yes. hundred calls. Yep. I got to the point where I was I was using accents, you know, like English accents <laughs> and every kind of accent I could drum up. Got to make it, would, it fun. And it would it would be terrible, but it, you know, it just passed the time. And um, but yeah, so it, it's it's tough, but you got to do it. And yes. What's what your job is, right? Being a exactly. You know, you have to, to prospect. You have to. And it, and I'm amazed about how little outbound cold calling. You know, just, I mean, I live in a pretty, pretty substantial zip code. Mm -hmm. I am not on the do not call list. <laughs> and we get hardly anybody ever call calling. Because I'll, I'll pick them up. Yeah. So I love to I hear. I love it too. I love My to hear wife what hates saying, it. She's like, uh, again, you're doing this again? I'm yeah, like, absolutely. Yeah, I like to, you know, I like, <laughs> yeah, I like we to just, hear what they have to say. I want to see if they're a good sales. Well, <laughs> seriously, we just, we recently sold our house about a year and a half ago. And it, I actually let it expire. And so as soon as you let it expire, all kinds of real estate agents are calling me up. And first, they would sit there and say, is this Mr. Bar, Bar? Uh, they couldn't even pronounce my name. <laughs> then the street I lived on, they couldn't pronounce the street name. And so I'd sit there. Wow. And, and so, again, where's my resistance going right now with those little yeah. nuances? Just first, you wouldn't even talk yeah. to him and hang up, right? And then I would, well, I would sit there and say, okay, why should I use you as my realtor? <laughs> yeah. And the number one answer I got was, because I'll get your house sold. So I'd say, okay, great. What would you, what are you do that? Well, I have a really good marketing plan. All right, tell me about your marketing plan. And every time I get, well, uh, why don't we sit down and look at it together? They could not communicate their marketing plan to me. They were not ready to make that for me to ask a question like that. I'm like, all right, I got a really good book for you to, to read. And after you're done it's reading that- Silver Bullet. Yes, <laughs> call me back when you're done with that. And I was just shocked. And, I, and at first, I'd, I'd give them a little praise. You know, I appreciate you making the outbound cold call. This is yeah. not easy to do. Well done. Keep doing it. You just need to have a little practice and really start- and there's lots of little things today that when we teach cold calling, that really it's the psychology of it. Yeah. Nobody's sitting there going, oh my gosh, when is John going to call me and talk to me about a new a non-QM loan so I get a refi so I can do my, redo my backyard. Right. So all of a sudden the call comes in and the person's not expecting it. So how do you do what we call pattern interrupt? Yeah, because in today's day and age, nobody likes to talk on the phone. No. Except for like a few odd people, right? They love to talk on the phone. 
I'm just kidding about the odd. Like, yes. yes. I have a few friends that are not odd, but they they just love talking on the phone. I'm like, just text me. Like, yeah. Or like when you now, like when you call someone, they go, is everything okay? <laughs> You're like, yeah, because yeah. just, it's just not yeah. normal, right? And the, the real estate market is, is still hot. Yeah. And so as, as a loan officer, a mortgage broker, you know, you got to be out there and, and talking to the real estate agents too. Yeah. They're still referring people. And most every real estate agent, if you can demonstrate a great experience for them, they are very unloyal often yeah. to their to their broker. Well, they want deals. Yep, you know? and they want deals to get closed. So right. if you can sit there and demonstrate, you know, your expertise mm-hmm. and that how you can help create a different experience for them and their their customers, they just want to get the house closed. So would you? I mean. What I would do if I had no deals is I'd cold call referral sources, right? Instead Absolutely. of instead of borrowers, I, I I think you know you just you get a lead or you pay for a lead online. You, it, the odds of that closing yeah. go down unless you're really great on the phone. But then they're just going to shop you and rates and stuff. Yeah, exactly. But uh, if you can get a really good referral source that can feed you deals, that's a hell of a lot better cold call. A hundred percent. Because then you're dealing with the professional and. If there's a way for you to add value back to them, then they'll take your call, right? Like, yep. just like you don't want to take a call from someone you owe money to, but if, nope. But if they owe you money, you'll take their call, right? <laughs> I haven't thought, I've never, never thought of it that way, but yes, I would. Yeah. So, um, um, like as far as you, you, you know, your business goes, like how how have you been able to tap into referral sources? So, you know, one thing we we do a ton of time on just a how do you ask for referral yeah again most time nobody yeah, let's ever, get into that because that's important okay good and i, I love talking about this because most people have never been taught how to ask for a good referral right so let's just say john that you are you're, you're my you're my client yep and we just we just actually just closed your house moved to your new house now i'm going to call you up and say hey john how's it going ga over here you know fun loans all right, I'm the retail division of fund loans now, not the not the not Which the we wholesale. Don't have, but yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, X Y Z lending. X Y X Y Z lending. Rancho Costa Funny, where I used to work. And hey, you know what? I'd love to, for your help. I need yeah. I need your help. Could you give me a referral? And that's how most people, you know, would right. ask. Hey, who do you know that could use my business? Right. And when I say, and hey, some people won't even ask that. They, no. They're too afraid to even ask for a referral. Right. Yeah. But yeah, when so they, they do, get there. Yeah. So so if I ask you, hey, John, who do you know? What's the typical answer? That most people give and ask, who do you know? Oh, my parents or, you know, my buddy. Come on, let's be honest. <laughs> what do they usually say when, when when you're asked for a referral? Oh, let me think about let it. Let me think about yeah, it. Yeah. yeah, let me think about it. So I'm like, okay, great. Well, it's Friday afternoon. You got big plans this weekend, John? Uh, Yeah. Going to hang out and play golf, whatever. All right, sweet. Well, have a great time. You know what? Maybe I can give you a call back on Tuesday. Maybe come up with a couple of names for me by then. Would that would be okay? Sure. All right, hey, have a great time with the family. Enjoy golf. Hit them straight. I'll talk to you on Tuesday. Cool. Now I'm a good salesperson, so I go to my CRM. Mm-hmm. I put myself at a task, call John on Tuesday, ask for the referral. Yep. Hey, John, is GA. How was the weekend? Or what if they just they ignore your call? Because they, well, they don't know it yet. They don't know <laughs> no, it yet. They don't ignore it yet. No, they usually pick up the phone and I'll say, hey, how was the weekend? And oh, you'll say, great, yeah. Hey, you know what? Have you had a chance to uh, come up with any referrals we were talking about the other week? Just really, really help me out. I really could use your help on that. Oh, uh, you know, I, no, sorry. I, I didn't think so. All right, hey, no worries. You know what? Might have give you, maybe we'll give you a call on Friday. Sure. And so that's all you go. So now when I call on Friday, where's my call go? To, yeah, to the voicemail. Goes to voicemail because when you say, who do you know? It's just the mental Rolodex of too people. Big of a, yeah. yeah, it's too big of an ask. Yeah. So the key to asking for a good referral, again, total process around this. Number one is thank them for the thank business. For the biz. yep. Number two is describe what is the typical client you like to work with. And really be able to describe that in detail. So the loan officer is describing that. Loan officer is describing okay. that. What's the type of borrower you like to work with? All right. Or if it's in, in a, re, you know, I'm talking to a real estate agent to refer me to another real estate agent. Maybe mm-hmm. it's the type of real estate agent I like to work with. Yep. Type of borrower I like to work with. Then places you where you may know them. And then so it could be you know that you're I know you're on the board of the YMCA or it could be you know a you know at your kid's school. Mm-hmm. So I start picking up places where you know. So when I say hey. Here's what my typical client looks like. All of a sudden, right. it reduces that mental Rolodex to a much smaller number. Sure. Then I start pointing out places where you can see that. So let me give you an example. So the the person you just did a loan for, say they were a business owner, right? Yep. So you're saying like, you know, just like you, you're a business owner. I like to do loans for business owners. You know, we have that, yeah. this program we just were able to fund you on, which is a bank statement program. Um, you know, so we work a lot with entrepreneurs and business owners. And keep going. So that's yeah. Kind of so like the yeah, star, exactly. Right? Yep. And so you may know them. They may maybe some of your vendors. 
<laughs> I know that you're a member. You're a member of Entrepreneurs Organization or YPO. Well, a lot of time business owners hang out with other business uh, owners. Other right? business yeah. owners, and, you know, at your, at your country club. Yeah. Uh, you know, I know you're on a, a couple of boards. So I start bringing, just pointing out places where you may know them, mm -hmm. and it's amazing. As soon as I do that, okay, here's what my typical borrower client looks like. Yep. Here's where you may know them. Then it gets down to a, a couple. It makes it much easier for them to come up with it a name. Be, oh yeah, Bob or Joe. You yeah. know, Joe. So I was, I was doing this with with a recent with a bank, mm -hmm. and I, I was teaching the program to them. And after class was over, one of the bankers down from La Jolla came up to me and said, "Hey, GA, I could really use your help. You know, I love to bank entrepreneurs. I love to bank uh, CEO, C levels." Also, like to do a lot of attorneys. Mm -hmm. So far, nobody has popped in my mind. But then she said, I know you're on the board of the YMCA, GA. I know I'm a member of Provisors, or it could be some of your neighbors. Well, soon, not until she said neighbors. My next door neighbor was the president of HealthNet. Mm -hmm. My other neighbor was, it was a big attorney. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until she said neighbor did those two people pop. Yep. And the attorney, so I gave him those two referrals. The attorney ended up being one of her clients. But I would have never thought of that if she said, who do you know? Yeah, you got to make it easy. That's just it, is you got to make it easy for them. Right. And then what- Trigger those little, those yeah. memories, right? And then what I do is after I sit there and again, thank them, what's my typical client look like, where you may know them, then I usually sit there and say, hey, John, you know what? Let me make it easy for you. Let me send you an email. You can edit it any way you want. And I send, I send my client an email that he can then edit and send off to the customer mm -hmm. or the referral person. And to CC me, then I'll take care of it from there. Right. But again, why are people afraid to give referrals? One is the, we make it hard for them to yeah. do it. Number two is they're a little afraid of what's going to happen. Right. Am I going to be stuck in this thing? Yes. Yeah. Or also, especially as a loan officer, mortgage broker, you got to let them assure that you're not going to be sharing their information with them. That's another, again, they won't say that to you. Right. Yeah. You know what? They don't want you to tell their friend about their problems yes you know they're, they're 600 fico and they're, they're two times they yeah, exactly. no know, like well they no. borrowed 500 grand like no we don't mm. they don't want their neighbor to know that yeah but when you make it easy what then what starts to happen is their reticular activator starts to pop up they start seeing that person more and more mm. so it only takes a couple of good referral sources yeah to start bringing deals in right again most people are afraid to ask for referrals. Yep. Step into the fear. That was and that could be your best money oh, source. 100%. For, business, for any business. Yeah, and that's, I mean, 98% of our business, my business comes referral. from yeah. come referral. And I, have I made a ton of money off of cold calling? Absolutely. Right. But we- You gotta do, you have to have multiple sources. 100%. You, know, you, get, you gotta have your, you know, your referrals, you gotta have your outbound cold calls, you got, and then in, until you're just too busy with inbound, right? Yeah. But you were talking about something when you were doing some training with us about the funnel. Talk yes. about the sales funnel. All right. And, so, and kind of when you do what. And, you okay, know, good deal. And your, it's again, so part of a big issue with, with salespeople is just how do they spend their time? Yeah. And how do they manage their time? And so what we see is you think, of, you know, think about a sales funnel. You got your sales funnel here. Bottom of the funnel, those are deals that are getting ready to close. Yep. Middle of the funnel, those are deals that are in, 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 in process right now, in underwriting. They are deals that you just now opened up escrow with. Mm -hmm. And so top performers, they come in. And they start off their day with working, not looking at their email. That's and they may glance at it real quick. Right. But all too often, I will sit down with a mortgage broker, and they sit down, and all of a sudden, their email becomes their to-do list. Sure. And they get in at eight o'clock. They pop their head up, and it's it's twelve thirty, and they've done nothing, no marketing whatsoever. Right. But they think they're really busy because they're working on current deals, trying to get some other deals closed. So top performers, first thing they do is they come in and they work on their deals at the bottom of the funnel that are getting close to closing. Mm -hmm. They check on them. They check on them and see where they're doing, see how they're going. Anything they need to talk to the borrower about, they'll call the borrower, create a little sense of urgency around that to get the borrower. It cracks Last me up. Last condition needs to come yes, in. Yes, this yeah. cracks me up. That you would think that borrowers would be all over that, get it to you immediately, but yeah. that's another conversation for another time. How do you motivate buyers to get you the, the, the stuff. content, the yeah. stuff you need? <laughs> but uh, so where I was waxing poetically about uh, lost my train of thought there. Uh, you're talking about oh, the, the funnel. Deal? Yeah. Yes, so the funnel. So they start off at the bottom of the funnel, working on the deals, getting ready to close. Yep. Then they go to what we call above the funnel activities. And those above the funnel activities, that's your marketing. So that's, you know, are you going out to lunch? Are you going out and visiting a real estate office? Are you making cold calls? Right. Are you asking, are you asking for referrals? It's like prospecting. Yes, it's all your prospecting stuff. But you got to put that into your calendar. you got to time block it. But it's got to be priority. Because mm -hmm. what can happen is your day can get filled up. And you think you're really busy. Yeah. But that's how you start getting these ebbs and flows in business too. Because you're working a bunch of deals. You worked hard. You did your, your marketing. You got deals in. Mm -hmm. Well, now you're working those deals. Those deals 
some fall off, some close. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, oh crap! You're looking. It's a new month, and you got nothing in the pipeline. Right. So constantly, deals are ready to close. Bottom of the funnel, then top of the funnel, above the funnel activities. That's mm -hmm. all your marketing, all your prospecting, and then you start working on the other deals that you're working on too. Absolutely. But it's that above the funnel activity that it, it can just evaporate. Next thing you know, days, weeks, months go by, and you've done no true marketing. One of the things that I used to do to, to help with that was someone taught me this a long, long time ago. They said, always have, and I think back then we did subprime, so it was, it, it, you didn't have to have as many deals because we made mm. more points or whatever. Yeah. But back then, so your, your number might be bigger than this, but um, was like always have five deals in appraisal status, meaning they could be either appraisal or further along. So like yeah. they're at docs or they're at you know closing, they're clear to close. But if you always have, so let's just up it to 10, right? So always have 10 deals that are in an appraisal status, like you have an appraisal order. Yep. And if, as soon as one funds and you only have nine, your job is to get another one in appraisal. And that's all you do to get that. You spend a lot of your time to get that 10th one back in appraisal. And then, you know, sometimes you'll be down eight and then back to 12 or, you know, whatever. But if you like, if that's your, if you, if you put a lot of attention at that, I think that's kind of what you're talking about, right? You have to worry about the top funnel. Yes, absolutely. And what's so funny too, I love that you're measuring how many deals at that moment mm -hmm. are in are, are working on the getting the appraisal. Right. That's a great place to look at because when you get appraisal, that, once that appraisal is done, the propensity of that deal closing skyrockets. Because so they committed yes. you know, some money to the yeah, appraisal. Exactly. And, so, yeah. so that's one. The first thing I try to do is get the, get the appraisal dollars out right. of them. Get them committed. Exactly. But the other the other piece of that is really making sure that you're, you're time blocking on your calendar of when you need to market, mm -hmm. but also are you measuring your dials? Are you measuring your activity? Right. Again, I mentioned the fact that the biggest issue people have is they don't tell it to enough people. Their activity level is not high enough. Right. So one thing I used to do is I used to check mark, hash mark my cold calls because mm -hmm. it can be really easy to sit there and kid yourself. Oh, do it's two, been an hour. Just, yeah, well, I did two, calls. Two, two, two or three calls. Yeah. I check my email, I check out my fantasy football, I check out my bracket, do a couple more calls. Oh, then I, I'm sitting there talking to a borrower. Right. Oh, I got lunch. Oh, now I got a, I got a company meeting. Yep. I make three or four more, more dials in the afternoon, do a couple other things. End of the day, my boss, my sales manager comes by and says, hey, GA, how many calls you make today? Oh, about 30. Yeah. And I made six. Right. It's really easy to trick yourself into thinking. And, and to you're lie to yourself. You're basically yeah, hurt, yeah. hurting 100%. yourself, shooting yourself in the foot. Yeah. So tracking your activity level. Again, top performers, they track the shit out of that stuff. Right. Why? Because they know it's it's that activity that's going to lead them to keeping their funnel full. Right. So yes, tracking how many people you have an appraisal and then what do I need to do? Am I making how many dials? How many... I mean, we have a whole scorecard around this too, and you can make different point systems around it. Mm -hmm. Maybe a cold call is worth one point, but going out to a lunch is worth five points. Mm. So you got to make it fun. Right. So again, marketing activity stuff for me, not the most exciting stuff in the world, but it pays the bills. Yeah. And it feels good when you, you it's like fishing, right? It feels good when you oh. get one on the hook. The, the, the weird part <laughs> is, again, cold calling, something I hate to do, but it's it's weird doesn't not you make you get one good call all of a sudden you get two or three good calls right you get on a and roll. it works but why why are people so afraid to do it and they know it works so that's my that's that's my pitch on pick the phone that, up i think there's people that like it and then, and there's just not not a lot of people that like it yes and so it's, it's one of those like it's kind of like some people love working out right and some people just hate it but those people that love working out they're super fit right? you, you know you know my whole philosophy in working out <laughs> my whole philosophy is oh so i'm not a, i I hate working out. My whole philosophy is no pain. No gain. No pain. No pain, no pain. Absolutely. And do you know why, John, I don't lift weights? Why is that? They're heavy. They're heavy. They're heavy. <laughs> right. But here's the thing. So I got a, I got a daughter getting married in August. Mm -hmm. And I probably picked up 20-ish LBs over COVID. Didn't we all? So I want to make sure I'm looking good. So this morning at 7 a.m., I was at the gym with my trainer. And did I enjoy any minute of it? No. Mm -mm. But here's the thing too. It's about having a strong vision of what yeah. success looks like. So I have a vision for myself. That I'll be on August 26th, I'll be walking my daughter down the aisle, mm -hmm. looking good, weighing 20 pounds less. Now that vision, I know I have to create specific habits to reach my vision. Yep. So those habits have to be going to the gym, eating healthy. So I start thinking about what are the habits I need to have? And then what are the activities that I need to be involved in that if I do these activities enough, it'll create the right habits, will then create the right results. So think about kind of a vision as a six foot ladder. 
my vision of, of dropping 20 pounds at the top of the ladder with me walking my daughter down the aisle. Yep. Then the goals are, you know, maybe I'm going to lose five pounds this month. I'm going to work out three times a week. So I start figuring out what do my goals need to be, then hit those goals. What are the habits I need to have? So the vision's your six foot ladder, top of the rung, but those rungs are your goals. Mm -hmm. And then I can ask myself, what activities do I need to be involved in? They're going to help me reach my goals. Working out three times a week. I hate it. Unpleasant activity, but it'll lead to a pleasant result. Me feeling better about myself, right. me feeling, feeling looking good. So, so that's why, like, I think I, I always would tell my sales teams that I would manage back in the day is put something on your wall, whether it's like the car you yeah, want, or yeah. whether it's, yeah, the, the, fit, it's, the fitness you want, or whether yeah. it's whatever. And then from there, you're going to see it, and then that's going to give you your why. Yeah. And the, the biggest thing is, again, cold calling, unpleasant activity for me, but it'll lead to pleasant results. Yeah. So right now, my wife and I, we're, we're, we're second homeless. So we're looking for we're looking for a lake house. You're sick and homeless. Yes. So we're looking for a lake house right now, and so yes, we've been looking at them, checking them out. But we talk about it all the time on my. Do you birthday, have a lake house on your wall? We have. So do you have a dream board? I do have a dream board. Do you have a lake, the exact lake house that you want on? Ah, uh, it's pretty dang close. Okay. And so my vision is, I'm going to wake up on my birthday, the year 2023, walk it out of bed, stretch out, walk out on the balcony, look across the dock with my boat, onto this beautiful lake in our new lake house. Nice. That's a good vision. Yes. You know, one for the last 20 years, our vision has been my children walking across the stage, shaking hands with the dean, turning the little tassel over, mm -hmm. taking that motor bar, throwing up in the air, and graduating college with zero college debt. Awesome. So I got two more payments after 11 years. It's going to be close to a half a million bucks of college payments. Wow. So we're super stoked. But that's a really strong vision. Yep. And why would I make outbound cold calls? Because that unpleasant activity is going to help me get pleasant results yep. and this whole thing on vision and vision to reality when I was failing and I didn't mention it when I was getting those cardboard boxes at 28 years old I had a paper out mm. I had to make $400 a month rent my wife was a school teacher I'd wake up at, at 3 30 in the morning go up to Escondido through 137 Wall Street journals <laughs> get back home around 6 6 30 my wife had hand us our brand new baby she'll go out to be a school teacher and I was taking my daughter over to grandma's house, then I was off to Encinitas to be that, that mortgage banker at Rancho Coastal Funding. And it wasn't until kind of my mentor taught me this vision to reality of how to create a strong vision of success, what that looks like, mm -hmm. and really be vivid with it, and then share it. Mm. And that sharing piece was the big aha moment for me. When you said share it, does that like share it with your wife? Share, share it with, with my friends, wife, share it with my share friends. With family, yeah. So like 20 pounds. Yep. So at my office, on Tuesday, we had a vendor came in, and I was on conference calls and, and Zoom calls all morning. About 11.20, I come out of my office, and my, my receptionist says, hey, GA, there are no donuts in the break room. <laughs> so there's a couple of dozen there. Yep. Now, I got to the office around 6.30. It's now 11.30. I've been busting my hump. Could I have easily rationalized that I easily. could? Easily. Yeah. I, I, I've been working hard. I deserve a donut. Yeah. But by me, her knowing my vision about what I want to do for my daughter's wedding, she was just having a little bit of fun. Hey, Gia, there's no donuts in there. Right. And just that little... Uh, that made you re reflect on that she knows. Yes, but also that I'm not going to... I don't need a donut. Yeah. Again, I would have would have loved a donut. Absolutely. Of course. Yeah. Would I have felt crappy afterwards? Probably mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. But I felt better, so I let people know my vision. And when I work with people on helping them create their vision, so I have, I have a vision for my work. Mm -hmm. I have a vision for me personally, GA Bartik, a vision for my relationship with my wife, my kids, and spirituality. Spirituality. You can spirituality. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, it's tough being a speaker with a speech impediment. <laughs> so, But I have, a, I have a, a vision for each one of those five yeah. elements of my life. Yeah. And I'm very, very clear, crystal clear about it, breaking it down from the vision down to the activities. Mm -hmm. So I can ask myself, what activities am I involved in right now? Is this activity going to help me reach my goals, yep. create the right habits? So again, you know, this morning. It's amazing how we're yeah. programmed at a young age, oh. right? Like if you if you at a young age would eat that donut all the time, then it's so easy as an adult to just oh. grab the donut. So but it's I'm not going to blame my parents at all. No, but, but like we just, yeah. right? Like at, oh, yeah, Totally. Yeah, we're when, I, when, I, when I got good grades, where did my parents take me? I don't know, Dunkin' Donuts? We went to Tasty Freeze <laughs> okay. to do a little chocolate dunk vanilla ice yeah, cream. that was your treat. That was for, my treat. all that hard work. Yes, right? exactly. So I've been programmed at a young age 
that food means success. Right. And so that, you know, when I'm traveling a ton and working hard, I had a tough day, it's easy to go to the airport, walk by, oh, there's a Twix bar. Mm -hmm. But now I got to really think through, is that going to help me get to where I want to go? Right. You know, is doing the marketing activities, I can come up with 37 things I'd rather do, but is this, if I can get this done, that's going to lead to the pleasant results I'm looking and for. And part of that, I think, is is making sure that you've, you've thought that through the night before or the day before in the morning, like while you're having yeah. your coffee, you're like, okay, this is what I'm going to do today. Absolutely. Right? Plan in and seeing what that vision is so that you know that's what you're going to do. Yeah. Because otherwise, yeah. you just, like you said, like being proactive versus reactive. I think most people are so reactive oh, and just on their emails. The emails have been the worst. Oh, the wor absolutely. I mean, it's the best and the worst because it's, it's, it's created this amazing instant like information, but also it's created this this problem where people do not proactively work on their day and their selves. No, it's you're, you're hundred percent right on that. And it's that proactiveness that is the biggest differentiator between poor performers and top performers. Yeah. The poor performers, everything happens to them. Mm -hmm. The top performers make stuff happen. Yeah. And, and I think it's also the difference between letting stuff happen to you versus you in control, making something yeah. happen for you. Yeah. And is there stuff that's going to happen in everybody's day? that we did not anticipate. Right. Absolutely. The question, the only thing you have control over is how you respond and react to that. Yep. And so getting back to this whole vision, and again, it's made probably the biggest impact in my life is having a really good vision. Mm -hmm. And I share that with my wife and my family and stuff. But what I find is most people are afraid to write it down. Mm. Because if I write it down, then all of a sudden it becomes real. And I'm totally afraid to share it. I mean, do you know anybody who has who's working right now on a book or a movie you know, I hear friends all the time. Oh, I'm, I'm writing. I'm working on a, a, a movie script. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Why don't they ever finish it? Mm. Because they're afraid if I finish it, then I have to sit it out to market and find out maybe it's not that good. Right. Same thing with people's vision. They're afraid to put it out there because they may not hit it. Mm. And do I hit all my goals? Absolutely not. Right. But I know if I don't have that motivation, mm -hmm. then my personal propensity is to do less than more. So yeah. I got I to figure, kind of trick myself into doing some of those unpleasant activities, like right. working out this morning to get those pleasant results. That's good. What's the rave scale? The rave scale. So I'm, I'm not sure if you're familiar, or if you're, you're a hockey fan at all? Not really. <laughs> all right. So, but I, if I was to ask you or anybody in the audience here, who's the number one greatest hockey player Gretzky. of all time? Yeah. Wayne Gretzky, otherwise known as? Uh, the see, great one. Yeah, the great one. He's known I, as the I, great I, one. I you don't get it. the nickname as the great one for if unless you are that great or like lebron the king right yeah exactly so true story when wayne was up in canada he was in secondary school mm -hmm. at which is their high school okay and he was a freshman and he made the triple a team that's our, it's our varsity team as a freshman he made the triple a team in hockey but he wasn't getting that much playing time mm. so he came home and he was telling his dad dad what is going on i'm not getting that much ice time what can i do to stand out in front of my coaches mm. And his dad at the time was watching the Olympics. And the, Peter Vidmar was talking about the Olympians, that they were all 9.2s, just the skills that they had. As soon as they hit any of the apparatuses, they were already a 9.2. Okay. What they had to do to the judges is do something a little bit different and unique to pick up other point twos. And so his dad saw this and came up on the spot, said, Wayne, you know what, we're going to come up with I'm going to call it the rave scale. And everybody on your AAA team, everybody on your varsity team, they're already great hockey players. Okay. So they're already starting in a 9.2. Mm -hmm. The key is what can you do to demonstrate some other little things that could help the team to get you other point twos and move you towards that score of 10 like the Olympians are trying to get to that 10. Right. So he says the R stands for risk. So I'm going to watch you during practice. I'm going to watch you on the games. And I'm going to see if you're taking a risk. Now, Wayne's got a couple of famous sayings. One is you miss 100% of the shots. 100% of the time. You don't take. Yeah. You miss 100% of the shots. You 100 don't take. 100% of the time. Yeah. 100 yes. Yeah, exactly. So you miss 100% of the shots, 100% of the time, take. you don't take. I thought that was a basketball player that said that. Was that's that, it. That's Wayne. That's Wayne. Okay. That's Wayne. And so he took a lot of risk on the ice, taking a lot of shots. Mm -hmm. All right. Because you miss 100% of the shots, 100% of the time. Right. You don't take. So that's yeah. so. So his dad said, if I see you taking risk on the ice, I'm going to give you another point too. So if he's a 9.2, he got another point two. Where is he out, John, right now? I don't need your HP-12C. 9.4, nicely done. So then he said the um, A stands for action. Okay. I need to see you taking action out on the ice. Mm -hmm. Now, Wayne, again, isn't the tallest player, not the strongest player, not the biggest player. 
but the, he was another saying he has is he does not skate to where the puck is. He skates where to gonna where, where it's going to be. Right. And that came from this action. Mm-hmm. And he, his dad said, if I see you taking action, you're skating to where the puck's going to be. And that's what people talk about all the time is he was always in the right place. Mm-hmm. Get, a, get a rebound, hit the shot back in. It's almost like he had a crystal ball or something. All the time. And, people, and all his players would talk about that. Just yep. his, his, the way he could find out and see the angles. That came from this action. So we got the, if his dad saw him taking action. He got another point two. So where is he now? Nine six. Nine six. V. Now his dad played the violin in an orchestra, and if you are a great violin player, what do they call you? It starts with V and rhymes with Oso. <laughs> virtuoso. A virtuoso. <laughs> so he said, "I need to see you being a virtuoso on the ice." Right. And again, not the tallest, not the biggest player, but his footwork is outstanding. He would practice his footwork all the time. Mm. So he's constantly had his body in a position to maximize the leverage to be able to get good shots off. Yep. And so that came from being a virtuoso on the ice. So his dad said, if I see that, I'll give you another point too. Now he's at eight. a, he's at a nine, eight. Good deal. And the E stands for energy. And his dad said, there's two, two types of people out there, Wayne, energy givers and energy takers. Mm. I need to see you out there giving energy to your team mm. on the ice, on the bench, in the locker room. And you watch video. You talk to his, his teammates. Wayne nonstop talked. Mm. He was talking on the ice to players. On the bench, he was like another coach on the bench, constantly talking to the players, encouraging them, mm-hmm. and giving them energy. That's great. And his dad said, if I see you giving energy, you're going to another point two. He's gonna be, now he's going to be a? Big old 10. But he never got a score of 10 from his father. The highest score he ever got was a 9.9. So the, the key is, you know, he went into the into the NHL as number 32. And when his father passed away, he, he then became number 99. He went into the Hall of Fame under 99 as a tribute to his father mm-hmm. that I'm going to sit there and look at that rave scale and do all I can to get those other point twos. Right. So, you know, talking to your viewers, listening to this, a lot of stuff you probably already know, you're, and you're already probably good at what you do. But what can you do to pick up those other point twos? All the other... LOs, other mortgage brokers out there, they're 9.2s also. How could you stand out, get some other point twos by paying attention to this podcast, your other podcasts? Working on it, practicing yeah. it. Yep, yeah. and being a student of the game. That's the biggest thing too. Right. It was funny. I was doing a training for a loan officer, loan company, and they had 24 people in it on this past Tuesday. And their number one loan officer, he, he laps everybody else. And I almost said, you know what? Don't even bring him into the program. He's already doing such a great job. Let him do what he's doing. He comes in and he sits front center, front row, right in the center. (laughs) And he was taking copious notes on everything I was talking about. And he was already so far ahead. Already so far ahead. And so there's a couple of newbies there. I'm like, dude, check out Guy over here. That's his name. So check out Guy. Look what he's doing right here. See all the notes he's taking? See how serious he's taking this? Because he knows if he becomes just a little bit better, it could lead to dramatic results. Right. And that's the thing is being a little bit better communicator. How many conversations are you having? If you're just a little bit better, you take check those nuances out, reduce that resistance, increase that receptivity. Over time, you're going to see huge results. And that's a lot of times people don't realize that it doesn't take a lot of changing of behaviors just small changes to create dramatic results right right that's huge so when your pipeline's low you need to work on these small changes small so changes that, yep and then you become i guess recession proof in a way like i mean not 100 percent, but you know if you're doing these things and you can actually protect yourself from these downturns if you Absolutely. already had those let's say like during the the crazy refi boom when everyone was slammed if if a mortgage broker took 10 percent of their day back then and learn non-QM or said, you know, hey, this isn't going to last forever. I'm going to start investing in, you know, some some outbound calls and I'm going to some referral sources that I can, mm, for sure. you know, versus just being like, you kind of go back, it goes back to the reactive versus proactive, right? Mm-hmm. When you're getting tons of leads and tons of That's things. That's easy. Yeah, it's easy. Anyone can do that, right? Almost. But then when, uh, when the tougher times hit, if you don't have those other things in place, then yeah, you get, and you get not only that, don't in, in place, but you don't have the behaviors and the habits. Right. That's when you're really gonna gonna have a tough time in the marketplace. Right. And so what we find too, in top markets and poor markets, it's the top performers. They're constantly in either one. They're expanding their business. They're expanding their book. Right. Right. Because they're constantly doing the things that are going to help create better results for themselves. Definitely. Help create more referrals. They're not saying, oh my gosh, I got so much going on, I don't need to do that anymore. Yeah. And it cracks me up too. Mid-performers will say, oh, I just work on referrals only. 
Yeah. Oftentimes they have the top performers. I do referrals, but I'm still I still do my outbound marketing. And mm -hmm. I hear that all the time. It's kind of people wear it as a badge of honor. Oh, I work on referrals only. Yeah. And but I find that the ones who are freaking lapping everybody else. They yeah, they get a lot of they, they get a lot of referrals, things. but they have they have multiple lines of uh, they're coming in and referral sources. Definitely. So, what inspires inspires you day to day? Besides, I know you said your your daughter and your and her wife. Yes. Yeah. Like I, I got I got three kids. We rescue greyhounds. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll be married thirty years this year. That's impressive. Why? Because I I, I my wife's never read the book. <laughs> I just simply use the process. <laughs> you use Ab it on her <laughs> absolutely agenda statement the other day we we're you know we were out celebrating uh our 29th anniversary nice. and i'm like hey thank you so much honey i really appreciate the opportunity to have dinner with you tonight really the purpose of tonight's dinner is just to celebrate our 29th anniversary first thing i like to do is order a nice bottle of wine love to talk about what's happened the last 29 years what's worked well what hasn't I have a couple of recommendations for you we'd like to talk talk about what are our goals for the next 29 years then from there we can talk about next steps make sense honey little tie down there anything else you want to do so i teach this agenda statement and i use it on her all the time <laughs> she, she doesn't know because she hasn't read the book has read the book and again there, there's something going on i mean we, we made it through three kids and Dude, and does greyhounds she, she probably appreciates that because she's like you know there's no like lull there's no like like boredom in this conversation appreciation she, yeah, yeah. I, I, that might be a strong word but well, no well, it, also, it, it works also, it works well for us though it, it shows that you're a leader but what know, really like leaders. Yeah. What, what what really inspires me gets me up in the morning is again i've been on both sides of the coin most people who are in my position who are out there teaching sales communication they sit there and beat their chest oh, look how great i am you guys mm -hmm. need to be more like me i you know bootstrapped it up and i made it made millions of dollars i've done all that but i did it the hard way yeah. and i had to figure this shit out on my own yeah. and so if i can help people every single day become more effective at communicating because i think communication it's the number one tool to building relationships. Right. And most people, again, underestimate the time, the energy, the effort it takes to become a great communicator. And it's the basis of everything of, of, of any relationship is how do you communicate? So, you know, our vision of at Concilia was to eradicate miscommunication. Mm. Communicate so you say what you intend to say mm. so people hear what you intend to hear. So when, I mean, I get inundated all the time with people, just success stories of, Hey, GA, thank you so much. This helped me out. And that's what get, gets me up and fired up and be able to talk to people like you who that's are cool. students of the game who want to become better. And again, I've, I've, been on, I've failed miserably and I've had a little bit of success. Success is a lot harder. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot more work to be successful, mm -hmm. but the payoff's a lot better too. So yep. again, being able to help people out is and help them become better communicators. I've, I've found my niche. My wife talks about it all the time is that, yeah, you know, he didn't find his niche until he was, you know, 30. Mm -hmm. And then it actually found because I and I traveled for before COVID I traveled somewhere every single week. People would ask my wife, you know, how do you do? You raise three kids. Your husband's gone all the time. And and my neighbor said, oh, have you ever talked to GA about what he does? He's so passionate about it. And his wife says he found something he's good at, and he makes pretty good money at it. That she could not keep me away from doing this. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so yeah. I get I get fired up every morning <clears> going <throat> out there and being able to talk to people and help them become better communicators. Cool, man. Reading any books or watching any uh, podcasts that you, that you could recommend or oh. other than your silver bullets selling? Got a, got another book coming out okay. probably September on middle managers. Okay. Middle managers matter. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's really, again, we've seen this in most organizations, that middle management piece, they're the redheaded stepchildren of, of management of the organization. Yeah, they get cut sometimes first. Or, they get, yeah. Yeah. or what happens is you, have, you take a good salesperson. Mm-hmm. And Monday morning, they sit there and have an opening to post the position for the manager. Wednesday, they they apply for it and they interview. Friday, congratulations, John. Monday morning, you're a manager. And being a great salesperson does not always equate to being a good manager. Very true. So again, it's all process-driven tools, techniques on how to set expectations, how to hold people accountable, how to have that difficult conversation with an underperformer, mm -hmm. how to run a great team meeting, how to motivate people. So it's, uh, the next book's coming out, it's, again, all about the right processes and tools to be successful on purpose. Awesome. How do we find you? If someone wants to find you online right. or phone number? Email, email? ga at conciliateam.com, C-O-N-S-I-L-I-O, right. team.com. And we'll put a link on it. Yep, and, and feel free. Call me up, 858-212-4486, or send me a text. Again, I'll pick up the phone. I'll answer your text. 
I get excited when I can help people who want to be helped become better communicators, which then helps them in their sales career. Awesome. Well, for the listeners, you guys know we're here to try to help further your career, make things better for you, get you guys excited about sales, selling non-QM, obviously. But, um, you know, we want to hear from you. We want, you know, if you, please share, please comment. Let us know what you want to hear and let us know, uh, you know, if, if you like this podcast, it'd be great. So thank you for coming on, John, GA. thank you so much. Fun yeah. loans, thank you so much for all you guys do out there. And again, like he said, if you're not doing QM right now, spend the time, talk to John, learn about that type of the business because it can expand your book dramatically. Sweet. See you on the next podcast, guys. Right, rock and roll. Bye. The Million Dollar Mortgage Experience Podcast.